because all that means nothing to God. Absolutely nothing. All you and I can see is the exterior. That's all we look at. And so our judgment is made of one another by what we see. I used to be really bad, not as bad now as I used to be, about first impression, snap judgment in 15 to 30 seconds. So you had already sized you up, categorized you, and said that's who you are. Do you ever do that? Yes. Yeah. That's a bad thing. So my judgment is taken very quickly on your appearance. I like to make eye contact. I'm not a phone person. I can look in somebody's eyes when I'm talking to them, and I can tell whether or not they're jiving and a shuffle. Amen. <laughs> a person won't look me in the eyes, then I'm leery of that person. Like, I'm going to use the name Hillary Clinton, if you noticed her interviews. I mean, you tell that woman to lie. <laughs> you can really. And I can tell when people are just right out flat lying <laughs> by looking in their eyes. And you know why? This is biblical. It says the eyes is the window of the soul. Right? And you might fool a lot of people, but you'll not fool God. And if you're sensitive enough in the spirit of God, uh, you can see whether or not it's right. So we need to get past this outward appearance. We need to get past of what people are seeing and observing and thinking what we are. Now the church began in the book of Acts, very first account of it. The believers that were there, they weren't called Baptist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, or whatever. <coughs> They were simply called believers. That's all. Because they had one thing in common. They all believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they believed that. And then they were called followers. Followers. They were called believers. So we're going to see this morning, this is the third message. I meant to preach it the first Sunday, all of it. But I don't think you brought enough lunch to hold out that long. So uh, God impressed on our hearts to break it down into three. So if you look, Acts, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, Acts 4 and 13, been our text for this is a third Sunday. Now when they saw, when they saw, there was an observance of the preacher that was preaching. And there was an observance of John that was with Peter that was doing the preaching. These men appeared to the ones that were around them that they had boldness. They saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, and here's my favorite word in the Bible, and ignorant. <laughs> they ain't no appeal for that. <laughs> Paul goes on to say like this, if a man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. You can't help that. So they perceived that they were unlearned. That means that they had not been to the theological school. They were not a graduate. They did not have a PhD. These boys were fishermen. That's all they knew was how to catch fish. And Jesus had told them, follow me, and I'm not going to let you catch fish, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. So they saw that they were bold, they had great boldness, and they were unlearned and ignorant men. And it says they marveled. That means they stood in amazement. They stood in awe of these men because they knew what Peter was doing was not a common thing that you could just see anywhere else. And it says that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, any time a person gives their life to Christ, automatically, instantaneously, automatically, that person's life changes. The way they walk, the way they talk, the places they go, 
and the things that they do. Automatically. If you're a cusser, guilty, I was. I was so afraid when I got saved, I had such a filthy mouth, it's going to sneak up on me. I'm going to let it rip sooner or later. And I was just walking around thinking, I'm saved now. I'm saved, so I can't give anybody a cussing. <laughs> what do you think? There are some of you that saved, <laughs> but you still let it rip. Uh -huh. Oh, actually, it didn't slip out. It had to be in there to come out. You've been practicing. <laughs> I had a fellow that one to the Lord. About two months went by. He came to my house one night and he said, I've got to talk to you, Crow. I said, What's your problem? He said, You have messed my whole life up. You have ruined me. I said, Why? He said, Well, I can't get drunk. I can't whip nobody. I can't give nobody a cussing. I said, I messed up. He said, Do you think it'd be wrong in me? And this was another guy that we knew. If I hired him just to go along with me and something happened, I could tell him, give him a cussing for me. What do you think? See, your whole life changes. You don't look through the same eye. You, want, you are somebody else, and the reason is you have been born again. You are a new person creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away and behold all things are become new. So you're experiencing this new found spiritual awakening in your life and you can't do those things that you used to do. But if you do there's something about it you think every eyeball is on you. And every person that you meet you think they know what you did. And if you do come to church, you'll think somebody gave the preacher the outline before you got there. <laughs> so when Peter stood and he preached, his boldness was a spiritual boldness. A spiritual. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't telling people what they wanted to hear. Now, I promise you, I could stand this morning and make you feel good about yourself. I could stand and, and encourage you, and you'd walk away from here thinking, well, he said I'm all right for the things that I'm doing, and I know that they might be questionable, but he said they're all right. I don't want to motivate you. I don't want to inspire you. I want the Word of God to convict you and change you that you'll have a spiritual awakening. Now this Peter that was preaching before the church came into existence, he was out giving everybody a cussing. The young maiden said, I know who you are, you're one of those. He said, I'm not. He changed spots so you can relocate, but whoever you are is going to follow you wherever you go. And he, another maiden said, you're them. He said, I'm not the last one. He flew in and killed them one down bad cussing and he's a Baptist. <laughs> Baptist to cuss you. Yeah. I'm telling you. They will really rip <laughs> you. And then they'll be holier than that. So they perceived that they had been with Jesus because the preaching that they were teaching had power, had a magnitude of power. Now what changed? It said when the day of Pentecost comes, it's the seventh week after the Passover. Uh, it's the number 50. It was a feast day that was set up by God in the Old Testament that was kept all the way through the Old Testament. So on the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room, 120, 
and they were there in one mind, one accord. God had told them, stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Endued with power. Until that day, they had no power. They were fleshly men doing fleshly things, and they had no power. But the power that God was talking to them about was the power that they would have because he was going to send the Spirit of God to dwell within people. So on the day of Pentecost, when it was there, it said they were in the upper room, there were cloven tongues like as a fire came and set upon each of them, and they began to speak in other languages or in tongues as the Spirit, now that's important, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the people outside, they thought they were drunk. The noise went abroad throughout the city. The city ran together, and they heard them speak in their own language. And it said, well, these guys are drunk. Peter stood and said, no, what you're seeing is prophecy being fulfilled. It says, Joel the prophet promised that in the last days, God would pour out his spirit. So that's something they had never experienced, they had never seen before, is a spiritual awakening. And they heard the word of God, the spirit was poured out upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there is a difference between filling of the Holy Spirit and being baptized. Now, when you get saved, when you get saved, you're baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit comes to live within you and take permanent residence there. That's Him. Right. And it says the Holy Spirit, it seals you unto the day of redemption. So you're His. You've been born again. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Now we're going to see this morning, there's one baptism, but there are many fillings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can fill you many, many, many times. This morning when we prayed in back, I prayed this prayer. God empty me of everything that I am and want to be and fill me, fill me with your Holy Spirit <coughs> For the message today, use me as a vessel that I might be able to pour out those things spiritually that you're giving me to say. So if I'm doing what God wants me to do, and God has filled me with the Holy Spirit, what I say this morning will not be my words, but they will be God's words controlled and poured out by the Spirit of God. Now I have the ability for you to give me a subject, and I can speak on that subject, just about anything you want to talk about. But that doesn't mean it's God-inspired. That does not mean that it has the power of God. Where the power of God comes is from the power of the Holy Spirit. You can, I can read the Bible, and there's no power there. It's just words called. But if I read the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, you listen by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the power of God is released. Right. Do you know why the world can they can read this Bible? Before I got saved, at every motel I'd go in, I'd look and there was a Gideon Bible. I'd get it out and I'd read and I'd say, that's the ignorance book I've ever seen in my life. I can't understand the thing that's in it. But when I got saved, I had different eyes. I had a different heart. I had a different mind. And then the Holy Spirit would live within me, begin to let this thing come alive to me. And I began to understand spiritually, spiritually, that there was a difference in my understanding because now I'm a new man, just like Peter. He couldn't do anything until the Spirit of God came. So the first message he preached was prophecy. said, uh, you're seeing what the prophet Joel said uh, would happen. Then he went on 
uh, and he talked about the Lord Jesus Christ, the works that he did, that proves that he's Christ. Jesus performed miracles. He raised the dead. He turned water into wine. And who could do this but the Son of God? Then we'll come to, to uh, after he finished the preaching, it says that there were 3,000 souls saved. 3,000 souls that gave their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The first church took place, this is in Acts 2, 42 through 47. It says that after this group was saved, they continued in one mind and one accord. That means they met together. They had unity because of what lived inside of them. They had unity of the Spirit of God. And they went to the temple. They prayed and Peter, Peter taught. Then it says they went from house to house to house. Now it took a lot of houses. 3,000 of them. It took a lot of houses. That means maybe five went over to this house. Ten went over to this house. Two went over to this house. And they break bread gladly. They ate bread gladly. That means whatever they took and cooked to eat, there was no griping and grumbling about it. I listened carefully back in the, the belt here, Paul. Y'all wake up. Who fixed that? Whew, they're nasty. I ain't eating that. Hold your hand up if you feel Let everybody see you. I heard you. I don't look good. It says they ate meat with They're just proud to get it. Yep. Why? Because something had changed in their life that they left off judging things by the fleshly mind and the outward appearance. They were tickled to death. See, what takes place in a person's life, it will affect how you act outside. So they had some pretty good actions going on. Now, they church, this was the first church, things were continuing. They had God in them. What was the difference in them? God was in them. God was in them. God had never been inside of man before. Now you think of that. If you've been saved, You've got God in you. I don't have God in me. If you've been saved, you've got the Holy Spirit, which is part of the Trinity of God. You've got God in you. So Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and there was a lame man, about 40 years old, above 40 years old, that was laid, carried, set, and he was begging alms. Peter said, silver and gold have a none, but what I have I'm going to give to you. Notice, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise, get up. He took him by the right hand and he said, immediately this man sprang to his feet. And when he sprang to his feet, something followed. Buddy, he went to shout. Why? Because the Spirit of God lived in him because he exercised his faith to believe that God could heal. Now, any person that comes and gives their life to Jesus and exercises their faith, you have the promise of God that he's coming in lock, stock, and barrel. He's moving in. You are his new home. You have taken on you, not a renter, not a border, but you've taken on you a permanent resident. I've had people come and visit me, and I sure was tickled when they left. <laughs> I've had people go to come into the house and I'd look out and I'd say, oh Lord, not again. <laughs> not again. They're coming. But let me tell you, I invited him when I asked him to come in, not for a day or a week or a year, but until eternity. I mean, I'm his and he's mine and he's there and so I've been changed. This is a spiritual
God did not save my body. God saved my soul. So I'm His and He's mine. Now any time that you do the work of God and you preach the Word of God and you receive the Word of God, then you're setting yourself up for persecution. Now if you think you're going to come and give your life to the Lord and everything's going to be a bed of roses, honey, go on, blow your brains out now. <laughs> That ain't what it's about. It's about God moving in by the Holy Spirit. And then you're going to be tested and tried to get you ready to perform the works of God. You're His vessel. He lives within you. So now how did Peter receive this? Well, he received it pretty good. He stood up in front of that heathen crowd and he preached. And he preached with boldness. So this man was healed and it upset the apple cart because they had never seen anything like this before. And when he got healed, the whole bunch, this is in the uh, sec third chapter, the 11th verse, and when this man was healed, they saw Peter and John, and that group took off running as hard as they could. Anytime there's something that happens that is not normal, that man can't explain, everybody wants to look at it. And they want to examine it. When we moved back from Michigan and after we moved back here, I got saved. And all my friends told on me, what's wrong with Glenn if Barbara? <laughs> right, Miss Barbara? She had messed him up. He is not like he used to be. So they had to have an explanation. They had to be able to explain why I wasn't the same guy they had known all my life. I got in a truck with two of them, got in the middle, going down the road. They had a cooler, and they popped the top, and they offered me one. I said, oh, no, I don't want one. And here they were drinking and going down the road, and I thought, God, what if somebody sees me in here with them turned up? They're going to tell everybody that I'm a drinking. So the next time they said, we're going to go so-and-so. Would you like to go with us? I said, no, I've got something to do. Now, I swapped a line there. <laughs> but I didn't want to go that much. Why? Because somebody moved in me that changed me outwardly because inwardly had been changed. Now, Peter had been changed. He was a lying, denying, cussing fisherman. Now, 50 days later, something happened in his life, and it was when the Spirit of God came and lived in him that man, oh man, business picks up. <clears throat> so they saw this, the boldness of it. And so they ran to him. They wanted to understand what was going on because they knew this guy had been lame for over 40 years and now he was up acting awful. You remember this show used to be on, I don't know whether he's still living, Bob Barker. Let's make a deal or the price is right. Yeah. Old Bob Barker, he'd stand up and he'd holler, Come on down! They acted awful. <laughs> <laughs> Running and a kicking. And if they happened to get the, the price right, man, they really kicked it in overdrive. Now, here's our expression. You get saved. I said, you get saved. Oh, yeah, I got saved. <coughs> you go to church? Oh, yeah, I go out there. Well, what do you all do out there? Oh, well, the preacher, he can't remember the words to the song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we don't do any better than that. Well, I'm just doing the best I can. <laughs> I used to be shy.
sharp-minded, but honey, that thing has left me. <laughs> it's gone. I used to could sing a song two times and have the words down and just never forget it. I can't even remember what, what I had for breakfast to eat this morning, Barbara. <laughs> it just happened. See, we can get excited about everything, but we can't get excited about us being a new person in Christ Jesus, and we have no boldness. Amen. Now, boldness described in the Bible is not like what we think it is. Bold is, you step over that line, I'll bust that head on you. <laughs> That's ignorance. That's not boldness. Have you heard, well, he'll fight a circle saw? That's not boldness. That means that you're living in the flesh so much that you only know how to react out of the flesh. That's all. But when you get saved, Peter would have fought. Peter would have died. But up to the day of Pentecost, now he had something new in his life. And it was spiritual boldness. Spiritual boldness. Now, every preacher needs to hear me preach this. And I needed to have heard this years ago. I want you to look at the 12th verse of the third chapter. 12th verse of the third chapter. And when Peter saw it, well, now what did Peter see? And Peter saw it. What was he looking for? And when Peter saw it, he answered and said unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or wholeness we have made this man to walk? Now here's what preachers need to hear. We preachers have big egos. Big egos. We like to strut like many roosters. We like to puff up. We like for people to say, you're good. <laughs> oh, that will blow us up like a toad frog. When we were on the road, we were in Indianapolis. I had preached a masterpiece. I knew it was. It was the greatest message ever fell from a man's lips. Oh, I was so puffed. Everybody hugging and kissing me and telling me how good it was. I already knew it. Man. <laughs> <laughs> this little old woman, probably 70s or 80s, she come doing that little shuffle. You know. <laughs> and I leaned down waiting for the great coffee that she was going to pay for. And she said to me very softly, you keep preaching, son, and one day you get where you can. <laughs> but ain't you talking about sticking a dull knife in a fat hole? <laughs> that took it out of me. <laughs> and I thought, why am I taking credit for something that I don't have anything to do with? That's what Peter was saying. Why are you running over here? Why are you looking at us that did we do this by our power? Is it, was it our holiness that did this? Now you watch TV preachers. Oh, you just come to me and let me lay my hand on you. You bring me $50 and let me pray over it. They count no power. They're tinkling brass and sounding cymbals. They are showmen. That's what Peter's saying. You think this man walked because I willed it? Do you think I have special power that I can heal this man? Do you think I am so holy that I can touch this man and make him walk? Oh boy, now you're going to bust the bubble. Here comes the explanation of it. <coughs> Thirteenth verse. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob and the God of our fathers have glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. 
But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and kill the Prince of Life whom God hath raised up from the dead. Wherefore we are witnesses and His name through faith hath made this man strong. Whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So why can we preachers take credit for anything? God saved me. God filled me. God gave me the written word. And God gives the message through the power of the Holy Spirit. How can you take credit? Of what you are. You did nothing but believe. You did nothing but accept Him. And the life you live. If it is a godly life. You live it by the power of God. That lives within you. Amen. That's why He gets all the glory. That's why He gets all the glory. So let me deflate your bullfrog throat. They swell up before they croak. <laughs> you have nothing to be swelled up about. You have nothing to be puffed up about. What you've got to be puffed up about is God. Peter has priorities. Things falling in place. Persecution. We're going very long. Fourth chapter. Comes the first persecution. 3,000 got saved. It said they added to the church daily people, daily, every day getting saved and being born again of the Spirit of God. Now, you're going to stir people up when you do right. You live right. You make them feel bad. Now, when you were yet sinners, if you got around a Christian, how did you feel? You wanted to get away from them? I did. I didn't want people out there, folks. They made me feel bad. They had me watching every word. They had me just, I scared to death. And when I got away from them and got back with the old crowd, I was comfortable. So when you get it right, then people are going to persecute you. Here comes the devil's crowd. Then the fourth chapter says the Pharisees, the scribes, it talks about the, the Sadducees. Now here's the thing that got them worked up. The Pharisees believed in God. And they believed in the resurrection from the dead. Now the Sadducees believed in God, but they believed not in the resurrection of the dead. Now what had Peter been preaching? Jesus died, God resurrected him, and so it made that heathen bunch mad. So they rushed upon him. It said that they were troubled. That means they stirred up that Ballard County. <laughs> they were fiercely stirred. And so they just laid hold on them. That means they took them. Whether or not they got a headlock on them, I don't know. But they took them. And they put them in jail. And they let them stay in jail all night long. Why? Because he preached the resurrection of Christ. If you die, you don't have to stay dead. He gave his life, they buried him, and he resurrected. You have that same hope in you is what he was telling them. And then, here it comes. Fourth verse of the fourth chapter. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about 5,000. Now they took the messenger and put the messenger in jail, but they could not jail the message. Right. The word of God instilled, they believed. Now the church is 120, 3,000, 5,000, plus those that were saved every day. How big was it? Well, before this church of Jerusalem gets done, it's going to be over 100,000 people. Now, we're talking about building some big churches today. 
Honey, we don't know what a big church is. And the whole thing about it is, they had not resurrected a steeple. They had not built a building, nor hired a music director, nor hired a youth director. They hadn't even ordered their padded pews. They hadn't ordered their air conditioning and their central heat and air. They hadn't even done that. What was causing people to get right? The Word of God by the boldness of the Spirit of God that lived with inside Peter. It wasn't Peter that was doing it, but it was God that was doing it through that man. And he couldn't take any credit for it because God got all the honor, God got all the glory. Now, the next day, he says, I'm going to preach a while. The next, you're interested, aren't you? <laughs> the next day, they took them out of jail. And so they took them where they had been 50 days before. The Sanhedrin court. Who had been before the Sanhedrin court? Jesus. He got crucified. He got resurrected. Now they're going to take this guy that denied and had him a throw down cussing fit. Now they're going to take him before the same court. How is he going to handle this? Something different about this boy. He might have got the fish smell off of him. Think he went and got him a new suit and tie? Cuff links? All they changed about him was what lived in him. That's the only thing that changed. And so it says that they took him out the next morning and there was Annas. He was the high priest. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, he was there. John, Alexander. It talked about the Israelites were there, the ones that were kin to the high priest. And so they brought Peter and John in, and they set them down in the midst of it. And so they started to examine them. Seventh verse of the fourth chapter. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Now this man was lame over 40 years. <coughs> and now he's up walking and shouting. And we demand you tell us. Now who was this? This was this religious bunch. This was God's chosen people. This was the high priest. Tell us by what power or what name, what name did you do this? We demand. I told you about being baptized in the Spirit of God. Now I'm going to show you about the filling of the Spirit of God. Then, 8 verse, then Peter filled, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we have this day be examined of a good deed to the important man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. Ooh. Now you're talking about going back, standing tall, and saying what God had in him. It can't, I just bet, I shot myself preaching sometimes. Now this is amazing. Barbara, she's, we talked about she said, I cannot identify with what you're talking about. There are times that I'll be preaching and things that I say is, is I've never heard it before. 
And you, you've seen me do this, I've stopped sometimes and hollered. Amen, Glenn! Have you seen me do that? You know why? I ain't never heard that! I think, did that come out of me? Where did that come from? Now that's spooky, Glenn. I know it. That's what Peter was having. He was saying things that he would have never said before that he didn't even know. And now the Spirit of God is producing it in him and he has great boldness. <clears throat> have you ever talked to anybody about Jesus and you walked off and said, I can't believe I said that to him. What was that? What was that? God lives in you. That's the Spirit of God. That's the power of God. Now notice, when he's, going, he's drove the nail. Now he's getting ready to clinch it. 12 verse. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be, and here's the second time you'll find in the New Testament this word, saved. Saved. Acts, 20, Acts 2, 21 was the first time it was ever mentioned. Saved. Saved have never been used in the Bible. What is saved? There must be something to be saved from in order to get saved. If you were in the ocean, no boat going down for the last time, and somebody reached down and took you up out of the water and kept you from drowning, what happened to you? You got saved. So when you accept Christ, what happens to you? You get saved. What do you get saved from? You get saved from the lake of fire. You get saved from your sins. You get saved from the guilt of sin, the penalty of sin. You are saved. Amen. So that's it. There's no other name given in the heaven whereby we must be saved in that wonderful name of Jesus. Now, I like, this is our text. We're drawing down, maybe. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, the 14th verse talks about these men. It said, hey, we can't say anything about what these men have done. We, we can't find any fault in what has happened to this man. We know this man was above 40 years. We've all seen him sitting outside the gate of the temple. we passed him daily going in and out. We know he's been lame all these years. Now he's walking. We can't say anything against that. 16th verse says, well, what shall we do? What do we need to do? Because something has happened, and they said that Jesus Christ in his by his name, this man was healed. Well, he said, we can't deny it. We can't deny it. So they called Peter and John back in. And they said to him, now this is what we've decided. Keep your mouth shut. I don't want to catch you. Have you ever told your children? I don't want to catch you over there doing that again. That's what they treat like little kids. Don't go out there and talk about Jesus anymore. Keep your mouth shut. Don't tell anybody that he resurrected from the dead. Keep your mouth shut. Well, Peter said, hey, whether it's right to obey you, whether it's right to obey God, I can only say the things that I know. I know he was crucified. I know that he was buried. And I know he was resurrected. And I had sought him go into heaven. And I know there's no other name under heaven whereby given unto men that you must be saved than that name of Jesus. So I'm just going to preach Jesus resurrected. Amen. Amen. Woo! Now, there's that boldness coming out. Great power that he had never experienced before was taking hold coming out in his life. Now, so they...
they threatened, told them, shut up. They let them go. Well, now if we had experienced that, that's like our government saying, hey, shut up. Don't you say another word about it because we're telling you not to. Same condition. This was a ruling faction that was there. First thing they did, 23rd verse of the fourth chapter, they lit a ship. They took off. But where did they go? They took off to the believers. They went to church. Boy, I'm excited now. They went to church. If I just got out of jail, church is the last place I want to go. I want to go home to Mama. I want to go home and let her tell me how good I was. I want her to fix me some fried chicken. I want to take a nap. I want to take a bath. They just went to church. Why? They wanted to tell the people of God that had been saved, hey boys, we preach the power of God that Jesus died, buried, resurrected, and that bunch in there couldn't say anything and they let us go. Oh, now business is really picking. I mean, this is a snowball running downhill. This is a locomotive that they have pulled the throttle wide open, snatched the controls out, and thrown it out the window. This is an automobile with the gas on the floor and no steering wheel. God doing some driving now. Now notice what they did. Twenty-ninth verse. And now, Lord, now that means something's taking place prior, but they're coming up to date. Lord, we've done what you want us to do. We've been in jail and let us go. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. All right, God, they've been threatening us. What are you going to do about it? Did God say, I'm fixing to fry them with a lightning bolt? Am I fixing to send fire down on them? Am I going to send my mighty angels and cut their heads off? They said, they've been threatening us. What are you going to do? And great unto thy servants, that with all boldness they may speak the word. 31st verse. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, for they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And now catch this. And they spake the word of God with You can't shut up salvation. Right. You can't shut up the Spirit of God. You can't shut up the power of God. All these years that I preached, I was a young man. I was 24 when I started preaching. 71 now, looking 72, almost dead in the eye. You say, ain't you about wore out? Yeah, but I'd rather wear out than rust out. Yeah. Don't you get tired? Yes. But I'm telling you what, friend, when it comes time to preach, there's something that stirs within me, stirs within me that God's given me one more chance to be a vessel of use. And I certainly don't want to disappoint my God that saved me. And so I say, Lord, empty me. And God, fill me with your spirit. And let me pour out the day you, death, buried, resurrection. That's the church, folks. That's the church. If we hired an orchestra, if we hired the greatest music director in the world and youth director and built buildings, it would not produce the power of God. What produces the power of God is the Spirit.
Spirit of God. Amen. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lived today. He walks with me. And He talks with me. He lives within me. And He is so great. And He is so large that He lives with everyone that invites Him in. Amen. So when you open your car door and get in your car, God's got in your car with you because you got in the car. <clears throat> when you open your front door and walk in your house, God walks in your house. Not beside you, but He walks in with you because He is in you. Wherever you go, God is with you because He is in you. There's where that boldness comes from. Mm -hmm. There's where the boldness <coughs> comes from. Close with this. 1976. We were the first white people that ever went to back in the bush country in Haiti. They had never seen white people. People were going naked. We got to preach two days, and there was an uprising in the village. And the chief, he said, Y'all are going to stay here in my hut tonight. And we couldn't understand why, and he said, The witch doctor. He is very, very, very upset. And they're going to try to do y'all harm. Well, the first thought come to my mind, we're a long way from with <laughs> And I don't know which direction it is. And I promise you, that's the first thought I had. Somebody gonna hurt me. I'm going to the house. Well, I couldn't go to the house. So we got in the chief's hut. And he put guards all the way around. At that time I think we had five young men and women that were teenagers that thought they wanted to be missionaries. So every year we'd go, we'd take young people with us to experience mission work. One of the young ladies, she was laying over in the corner. They got rats that long. <laughs> and she said, Brother Glenn, there's a rat looking at me. I said, honey, that's all right. That rat's not going to bother you. She said, yes, but I got cookies in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs>
poor little old lady up in Kentucky that is county court clerk that would not sign for homosexuals to marry. She said it was against her belief. I watched them on TV. One said she's had three or four kids out of wedlock. Who does she think she is? Another one said all them little kids running around are bastard babies. One man, talk show host, said, show me where she's at and I'll kill her. Now this is in America. This is in Kentucky. Another one said, she's trying to make a martyr of herself. She's just wanting attention. Hadn't seen her say a word. Hadn't seen her on any talk show host. Homosexuals came in and set up on what authority are you not issuing license? Well, I'll go to my grave remembering the words she said upon the authority of God. Where did that come from? What lived in her came out, and it was the Spirit of God saying, upon the authority of God. Amen. Amen. Now, folks, that's deeper than I can think. Upon the authority of God. That's why Peter was preaching. Folks, this is our roots. This is where we came from. Yeah. What kind of stock do we have? I had a good mother and father, but I've got a great father. I've got the greatest father. If you know him, you've got the greatest father. He'll produce in you what you'll allow him. I believe there are people that are tired of living the way you've been living. I believe that. That's right. There's something different. Let's stand. Dear Lord, your gracious mercy, today is the greatest thing that we've ever known. Father, as we begin, musicians begin to play Amazing Grace, and we get ready to give this invitation, let it be known, God, that we don't have the promise of tomorrow. In the name of Christ, amen. I want every one of you to just look at me. I do not, you do not know the moment, the second, or the hour of the day that you're going to be called back. You don't know. Every second, every second, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Every time, every time that Somebody dies. That's beyond my comprehension. A priest of infant babies. 1972. I said, oh God, why? I preached two, three, four, five, ten year olds, teenagers, people in their nineties. It's not amazing. Don't know. 